Hi everybody, it is June 30th, Wednesday, halfway through another week. Um, I don't know, you know, I've just been, been once again up at the crack of dawn, Jesus. I, you know, I'd, a dream would be to sleep in someday, maybe past like, past like seven would be amazing. I usually wake up and I kind of glance over and I've had a dream and, and it's like in the dream it's nine o'clock. Then I glance over at the uh, at the clock and it's like 5.15. So I ended up getting up, going out and doing a bunch of watering real early uh, just to get things moist before the heat sets in. Uh, so I got all that done, got a couple of book orders to uh, get over to the post office. Um, another song to download for, I heard from Ian Pace, and he was real happy with the track that I sent him, so I've got one, another one to go, and some other things to take care of. Um, just, it seems like every day there's just lots of stuff. I just can't wait to play a gig. I see a lot of people um, posting their gigs on uh, Facebook and stuff, and I'm just going, man, I can't wait till we get out there. You know, it's getting close to the Peter and Peter Asher, Kate Taylor, Albert Lee run. So I'm really excited about that. And then I think I'm doing a corporate um, with Lyle Lovett in the beginning of September, uh, I think in Houston. Uh, and then after that, we get prepared to uh, um, hit the road with the immediate family. So I'm, I'm really excited about that, but it's just, it's still slightly distant. I'm <laughs> just uh, chomping at the bit to get out and do it. And I hope things don't get screw up, screwed up with this new variant that's going on. There's a bunch of new mandates coming back in about masks because this one is really a bad one. And uh, it's primarily hitting unvaccinated people. So I mean, I, whatever your intentions are, just try to be smart about this because this is, this is not, uh, it, it ain't over as they say. Um, so today I was thinking, you know, I'm, I was looking at a bunch of different things I've worked on. And one of the albums I really loved doing um, was with James Taylor, and it was his album Never Die Young. And I think we did that one around 1988. And we did that at the Power Station in New York, which was really a great studio. And we had just a great time uh, there. I always love when I get to go to New York to work anyhow. Because um, it means I can get a good slice. <laughs> Just, I, I can't wait till we get back there with Peter, and uh, and Kate. I think we're going to be in the city, and uh, I'm going to stuff my face uh, with pizza. And and actually, when I talked to Ron Carter, the other day uh, when we did our little Zoom video, he says I've got a place for us. So he wouldn't tell me where it is. He said I got to take you there. So uh, I'm hoping to hook up with Ron. And maybe I'll do a little video of me and Ron eating pizza or something like that. Yeah. Uh, we'll find out what that's all about, though, because my favorite place, um, Wadi actually turned me on to it back in the 70s, um, early 70s, when we would go there. It was called Charlie's Corner on 58th and Lexington. And, man, it had just, like, the, the best pie and um, would always, like, if we were driving the bus through town, if we were gigging, always go there and grab a couple of pies and put them on the bus for our drives. And it was great. And I remember Carlos Vega and I going there one night, in like, at the very end of the, uh, of the night there. And uh, we actually both had bikes in New York because it was so much easier to get around to, on a bicycle than to, you know, deal with cabs or anything. And we were sitting there, and we got our slices, and put our crushed red peppers on them. Well, it was the end of the night, really not thinking, and kind of just red pepper dust came out of the uh, little dispenser. And uh, we both picked up our slices, snapped them, got ready to eat. And we, we were sitting at a table looking at each other, and just as we were about to bite, we in, each inhaled and inhaled all this red pepper. And man, it's like just things started coming out of every orifice of our bodies. It was unbelievable. Uh, yeah, we were dying. It was just too much. It was like we were sitting there 
shaking. I mean, we weren't about to give our slices up, so we're sitting there shaking our slices and you know, wiping them with napkins, trying to get some of this dust off. And then we finally just, you know, went for it and but drank a whole lot of, I don't know what the hell we had, Cokes or something like that, just, you know, downing a bunch of liquid, trying to wash this, this unbelievable burn away. But it used to be fun, and then a number of years back, got to New York and went there, and they were gone. Apparently, the landlord had raised the rent so ridiculously on this corner that they just uh, they bailed. And somebody somebody said that they thought that the family was out of Long Island. They may have, uh, um, or one of the, one of the uh, areas up there. I don't know, maybe Brooklyn or whatever. Uh, but they had gone on and and it hopefully opened a place somewhere else. But it was a drag. And then Wadi and I found another place that was as close to it as we ever found. And I think it was over around. 54th Street, like between 6th and 7th, somewhere in, in that stretch in there. And, um, you know, I, I, I always have this good luck. Somebody had been screwing around, and I got my slice, and I go to put my peppers on it, and somebody had unscrewed the lid and just laid the lid on top. So as soon as I did that, the whole bottle of, of crushed peppers poured out on the slice. But thank goodness... The guys working there saw it, and they came over, gave me a fresh slice, and went and refilled the bottle. But, you know, some people are just, you go, really? Really, you had to go do that, huh? It wasn't just an accident. Uh, but once again, uh, like the next year, we went back and uh, gone. place was, was, you know, had gone out of business, and uh, man, it's a drag when you find places that you dig. And I've I've had this all over the really kind of all over the world, but certainly all over the country, where there's certain restaurants that you really get a Jones for. I always loved going to Nirvana in New York. It was one of the most wonderful Indian restaurants overlooking the park. Um, and uh, it, it eventually went out. i uh, got so many of them, losing the Carnegie Deli, the Stage Deli, so many of these places. Um, I'm, I'm so glad I still have... Uh, my friend Kevin Albender to uh, look forward to seeing because he he handles runs Katz's Deli so I'll go there and I go to end I'll end up going over to Joe's Pizza and uh, and grabbing a couple of slices when I'm there that's Wad and my uh, go to joint now uh, that's just so it's so convenient when you're staying in Midtown so that's that's my food moment here. Um, but so we were back, I forgot where we started now, I'm suddenly going, oh yeah, James's album, Never Die Young. Um, so we had a great time with it. I made a, a, a few, I, I remember most of it, but there's a few copious notes here. Um, the band on, uh, on this track is myself and the wonderful Carlos Vega. Um, the great guitarist Bob Mann, Don Grolnick on keyboards, and Dan Dugmore, and the background vocalists on this is our, our Arnold McCuller, Rosemary Butler, David Lasley and Lanny Groves. Um, it was engineered and mixed by James Farber, and it, this was produced by Don Grolnick. And I miss Don so much. God, we talked a lot before he passed when he was really fading, and it was just, it broke my heart. This guy had so much talent. He was so gifted, and, um, and to go so young. Uh, cancer is an incredibly uh, cruel thing. It really doesn't... Uh, doesn't play favors, that's that's for sure. So, so um, I'm gonna I'm gonna see if I can remember uh, the the title track on this. I, I haven't played this. I don't know if I I don't think I've ever done a video about this one. Um, I'd have to go back and look, and it's getting really hard to keep track of uh, a lot of this stuff now that I'm like up in the kind of 600 range of videos. Uh, but I don't believe I did, and if I did, well, I probably played it better before or whatever. We'll find out. Um, but this is the title track to Never Die Young, and it's called Never Die Young. Amazing how that happens. So let me... Uh, and this is the bass, Frankenstein, that I played on the original track. So let me see if I can dig deep into the memory banks here and grab this one. start from the beginning. It's always hard on this crap.
do happen. I remembered it. <laughs> it's, uh, it's sometimes, boy, some of these things just come, uh, come roaring back and you just kind of go, it's, it's great. It's there. It's still, it's still got it. Uh, and some of them are a little more of a handful, but, uh, uh, and plus Frankenstein, it's, it's, it's kind of like, you know, a horse that gets out and the rider falls off and the horse knows how to walk back to the ranch. <laughs> Uh, while well, the person's laying in a ditch. Well, that's me with this bass. The bass will know the tunes, even if I don't. And I just, I'm just along for the ride. So, um, I'm going to wish everybody a great day. I think I'll just keep this one concise on here. Uh, I, I love that album. There's a bunch of really good songs on it, and we had a great time. And one of our, our tech guys on it, who took care of all the guitar tuning and piano tuning and all that, Ed Kolakowski, um, he, he, Ed was one of my favorite hangs on the road. Ed and I spent so much time together. And Ed, 
uh, eventually um, moved to Marbella, Spain, where he lives. And um, but he, uh, yeah, we we had so many adventures together. But he was a brilliant, brilliant um, technician to have on the road. He was trained at Steinway in New York, and you could blindfold the guy, and he could take us concert piano apart and put it back together again. And I remember going over to uh, Steinway with him uh, one time and down in the basement is like a lot of the great pianists had their pianos stored there and there was a whole bunch of pianos and I went around and he said, no, check them all out. And I tried a bunch of pianos and he was just kind of going, holy crap. So that's what like a really great piano is like. And there was one like right in the middle of the room and the other one played it went, God, this thing feels terrible. It's kind of funky sounding piano. I mean, it was a concert, you know, Steinway, but it just wasn't. And uh, he goes, everybody who comes in here thinks that piano sucks. Andre Watts, you name it. I mean, whatever great concert pianist comes in that room and goes and they go up to that piano and they play it and they just go, yeah, I don't know what's wrong with this piano. It was Horowitz's piano. <laughs> and he said when Horowitz came in the room and would play that piano, it was the best piano in the building. He had a a relationship with this piano. His touch and everything was amazing. And he said it was always just mind-blowing that when when Horowitz would come in there, all of a sudden that thing would just come to life. And uh, it's really cool. But I, I loved being over there, there was just meeting the people over there. And, and Ed had, was a tuner at... Um, I'll, I'll tell you a, an Ed Kolakowski story. Um, Ed was a, uh, did house tuning at Carnegie Hall. And apparently at one point, this violin, I think it was a violinist, came in and uh, was going to be doing a concert. And he, so he came in and wanted Ed to tune the piano. But he started off by saying, you piano tuners all suck. You guys are the worst. You, know, you make my life miserable kind of a thing. And Ed's kind of going, wow, <laughs> hello to you too. Now it's the family. And uh, the guy pulls out a little velvet lined case with his tuning fork in it. And it's stamped A440 on it, and that's how he wants the piano tuned with his tuning fork. So the guy gives him the thing, and he leaves. And Ed goes, and he opens up the piano, takes out the tuning fork. Beep. Kind of going, hmm. Checks the A on the piano, tuning fork. Tuning fork was not in tune. It was stamped, but it was not accurate. And so Ed said... I thought about it and he thought, you know, I could, you know, tune the piano to this tuning fork, but it would have to sit for a day and settle into this and then tune it again. But it shows tonight. So rather than that, he went ahead and tuned the piano the way he always would tune a piano. And then he got it using his own ears and tuning fork and he got out his files and he worked on that guy's tuning fork till it was finally perfect and, and in tune. And when the guy came and did the gig, he went over and was hugging Ed, saying, you're the greatest piano tuner I've ever... You, you, somebody finally got it right, and all this. And Ed was, said he was just thinking, he just saved the, 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 the stress level in lives of so many piano tuners yet to come that were going to be dealing with this guy. But, I mean, I love that that was the way Ed thought. And I mean, and Ed had been on the road with Zeppelin, and he, you know, he'd been out with James for years, and he was just one of those guys. I mean, he was just a complete character. We had so many great adventures uh, on the road together. I, I miss him dearly. And he's actually in my book. Uh, I got a picture of he and his wife uh, in there, so I was thrilled about that. But, um, you know, there's always backstories to all these things. Um, I don't know if I ever told my Michael J. Fox story, but at, maybe next time I'll, I'll tell that one, which was really an interesting little side note, but I'm going to get jamming now and take care of a bunch of stuff that's got to be done. I want to go check the news too, because I caught a glimpse uh, of something on the news before coming up here and he had just gone by and I'm re if it's true, I'm totally horrified by it. But apparently a, um, a judge, I think in Philadelphia or Pittsburgh, somewhere back east, overturned Bill Cosby's conviction and let him out of prison. Now, if this is the case, I'm, our justice system is so desperately broken uh, to let this monster back out on the streets again when there was so much evidence and so many people 
that came out against him for all of the incredibly abusive, terrible things he did to women. And for him to be on the streets now, I think, is just a grotesque miscarriage of justice. It's just my feeling on it, but boy, I'll tell you, I followed that case, and there's no way this guy should ever have seen the light of day again. Uh, so I'm going to go check that out, see what's going on with that. But um, I will be back uh, tomorrow. I've got a interview um, with Chris G.C. first thing in the morning tomorrow. Um, who, he runs uh, Bass Player magazine. So I'm real curious to see what uh, Chris is up to. And uh, and just things move on every day, just you know, more stuff to take care of. I think I'm going to do a little supermarket run and get some provisions and, uh, and then get to work this afternoon on another Ian Pace song and a couple of others that people have sent me and another project that I'm way behind on. And then I'm going to talk to the guys because we got to start doing some filming for our next video. And we've got a great idea for it. We just got to get together and it's probably going to be at Mr. Postel's house because he's got a big, huge green sheet and we're just going to use that as the green screen that we need for the things that are part of it's going to be. So just little little nuggets I'm tossing out there. So uh, take good care. Have a great day. Um, I, I was just watching the news this morning too, watching all these people digging through this mountain of rubble as bodies are slowly being discovered in this terrible tragedy in Miami. I can't imagine what these rescuers are going through because it's still a rescue at this point they talk about you know whether it's been earthquakes around the world and buildings have collapsed and they've found people alive after two weeks i mean they're in t terrible shape but they're still alive and they, you know they managed to be somehow down in a pocket that was tucked away um so that you know they have to still be incredibly methodical about going through this thing but boy I, I can't imagine the stress level everybody's feeling on every every aspect of that. And again, with the uh, with the new strain of the virus to, uh, rearing its ugly head, um, thank you again to all of you um, first re frontliners on here because your work is nowhere near done. It's uh, it's one of those things that this is going to be going on for for some time. <laughs> I'm out of here. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye-bye.